Welcome to the Everyday Citizens Tactical Podcast, Episode 17, Reconnaissance and the Tactical Civilian. My name is Jeremy and I will be your host. Today, I am joined by a fellow Marine and the CEO of Maneuver Training Solutions, Blake Flannery. Today, we're going to dive into Blake's military career, his take on modern reconnaissance, and how it applies to the civilian side. So, without further delay, let's dive in. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder. Yeah. Call me what you wanna, but you can't call me no coward. Yeah. Strength in numbers, we the people, still the ones with power. Fighting fire with fire, time to take back what is ours. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder. Yeah. Call me what you wanna, but you can't call me no coward. All right, guys, welcome back to episode 17. And Blake, welcome to the podcast, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so, I mean, even I am not overly familiar with you. So if you want to kind of give everybody the the rundown on who Blake is, what your story is, and, you know, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, sure. So I am Blake Flannery. Uh, I am a retired Marine. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. Uh, I enlisted at the beginning of my senior year and then headed out for boot camp uh, a couple weeks after graduation. I was in boot camp uh, for the events of 9-11. So that kind of changed a lot of people's outlooks and mindset on things. I reported to my first unit in the infantry, uh, Camp Pendleton, California, with 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, served there for a few years, a couple deployments to Iraq, and uh, coming back from the second deployment, I took selection for First Force Reconnaissance Company, and then spent the next uh, about 17 years uh, in uh, Marine Recon. Uh, since retired from Marine Corps in 2021, I have been working a few different things. Um, good number of people may or may not know me from you know the Instagram. Uh, my main page, Blakewater0326. Uh, I've also been working with Orion Training Group uh, since I retired, and I have been working a, another contract where I train uh, Coast Guard, uh, Maritime Special Response, and uh, Tacklet through uh, kind of an entry level course that they have to be qualified for their teams. <clears throat> awesome. Well, I'm definitely glad to not only have another Marine on, but also a fellow leg day advocate such as yourself. Absolutely. Every day. A little off topic, but, and I've never taken a course from OTG, but it definitely seems like the team over there is definitely starting to bring some different aspects to the training uh, community, especially on the civilian market side. Yeah. So uh, that was really one of the the big things um, for the company, you know, and it really, uh, OTG was started by, essentially by a group of civilians. Um, so Jared Arsenault, the uh, owner of OTG, mm-hmm. he saw kind of a very amateurish uh, YouTube video or maybe it was on Instagram. And, you know, these guys, they just didn't know what they didn't know. They were doing a lot of like silliness that, you know, had they been doing it with live fire would have been incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. And he was a young, younger officer or a law enforcement officer at the time. So he was hopping in their comments and kind of trolling them. And uh, one of them was like, well, why don't you come show us what right is? And he's like, well, okay, I will. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, <clears throat> he went to uh, he went to that individual's property. Um, that's uh, Mitch, who is now also the uh, OTG uh, audio video guy. Uh, he does all the uh, OTG YouTube videos. And he, he put together a, a small class. So if you've been following... Uh, you know, OTG from the, the earlier days, you know, around, uh, would have been 2021, I guess, or you know, earlier in 2020, mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot of like CQB videos of like small plywood wall buildings and dirt floor. And that's, that was that property was inside of a barn. Um, and he realized there was something to it and that he could teach, you know, civilians and that there was a, a lot of people who wanted to learn this stuff. But there was also a lot of gatekeeping and badge protecting. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, with his experience within law enforcement, is that there were a lot of cops who just were not very well trained. Um, 
a lot of times not really, you know, to a fault of their own, just it's not offered through the, the departments. So OTG was stood up to create all that, and it's really become more than about, oh, we're just going to teach CQB to civilians. It's about building community and reinforcing this idea of like being good people, uh, being good to each other. Uh, and so that fellowship that we have in the classes is really what has made the company grow. Like there's a lot of other places you can go and get training, you know, maybe not so many places that are offering open enrollment CQB and, and field craft, but hmm. it's the camaraderie, the fellowship, that sense of building community that I think is really setting Orion training group apart. Again, off topic, but I kind of want your opinion on this because you've been there, done that. Now you're on the civilian side working with guys that are in, you know, the market, the industry of this. With the rise of different level CQB and room clearing classes, what is what do you think something people should be aware of as far as vetting instructors or companies before signing up for something like that? Because you're right, there's a lot of gimmicky stuff. Yeah, um, I... I can get that it, it might be hard for, you know, the, the average Joe to look at social media and company websites and really decipher what it is that they're looking at. Hmm. Um, you know, what I would say, and, and I've, I've kind of given this advice to a few people before, but you, know, you can go to the website and check it out and you can kind of, you can kind of determine some things based on like, you know, how well the website's built and all that. But at the same time, you know, if it's like me, I, I try to manage my own website and I am not a web designer. So oh, it's it, a pain. Yeah. It kind of sucks in certain aspects, but just looking at more of like the, the actual content that is put into it, you know, trying to get a feel for it. Um, you know, if there is a, like an about us or about me, you know, kind of page on there, which there should be, you know, are they, are they really just trying to tout their their background or are they focusing on what their goals are for the company and the students? Mm -hmm. You know, because I've seen some of those and there are some people they're really like really trying to sell you on like their factor of cool guy. And mm -hmm. it's like I don't care. I want to know like can you teach me? what it is you say you can teach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I think yeah. there's a level to the cool guy factor as well, because most likely what you're teaching, you know, intro to room clearing to a civilian basis, your level of cool guy really only matters for so much for that because you're not teaching them cool guy stuff. You're not, you're not teaching them, you know, advanced breaching with charges and all that kind of stuff. It, it doesn't take that to do a, like a, a single person CCW perspective or like a small team base for like a police department. You don't have to be a cool guy to do that kind of stuff. You should be, right. you know, right. ex somewhat experienced and taught from, you know, a wide variety of people and you've collected different skill sets and you're like, this is what I think works best, but you don't got to be Johnny cool speed to, to teach intro level stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, from there it's like, you know, look at their social media. Like, you know, what do they have? Um, uh, and again, you have to take a grain of salt, you know, mm -hmm. um, not everyone like Orion has just recently branched out. Uh, they made a Twitter page. I don't have a Twitter, so I have no idea what it looks like. I don't know what he's putting up there. Um, but there's a Twitter page now. There's a parlor page. Um, so, you know, grain of salt, they're not going to be like a corporation that has every social media under the sun. They're probably going to, you know, prioritize their focus and it's probably going to be Instagram because it's an incredibly popular uh, platform. Mm -hmm. But you know, look at their social media and look at like their their posts. If they are making posts where they are giving away free information, mm -hmm. like you could pay them to come take a class, or you could sit there and scroll through their page for you know a half a day and essentially learn the same thing. That should tell you that they realize that they have a lot to offer mm -hmm. and that coming to them will get you even more than just what you can hear and just see them perform 
you know, off of social media. If it's more of like just marketing and it's just like, here's a class, here's a class, here's a class, here's a class, come take a class, come take a class, pay me, pay me, pay me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, again, maybe be a little more hesitant uh, with people like that that aren't really willing to put out that those free tidbits of information. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then from there, you know, look, go look through the comments, actually scroll through the comments, you know, people on Instagram hate to read, but actually go read, like look at the caption, look at how well together the caption is, is put. Um, and then look at the comments and see how they deal with commenters. You know, do they, answer questions as honestly and thoughtfully and as fully as possible? Do they blow people off? If they get contradictory opinions, are they immediately argumentative or do they try to work things out with this person uh, and come to an understanding? Uh, Or do they keep limiting comments and turning comments off? Mm Because that tells you that they don't want conversation. They, They don't they don't want it all. They can't handle it. And then again, also look at their content. You know, the stuff they posted, the stuff that they post is just about like trying to put down everybody else. That's like, you know, not in their camp. Um, also somebody potentially to be wary of. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, it's a lot to, it's a lot to manage. Um, and <clears throat> it's unfortunately you know, likely if you're one of those people who's like, you know, I'm going to take, four classes a year, five classes a year. Uh, you're eventually going to take a bad class. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to take a class where the information you get might be great, but you know, the instructors are not. And so it kind of ruins your overall experience. And then you're going to, you're going to take classes from people that are great. You're going to have a great time, you know, learn a lot. Instructors will be great. You'll have the camaraderie of the other students. Um, and it was being all around, great experience and i think i think people's appearance specifically when you're small and you're starting off or your instagram gets deleted 10 times like mine your (laughs) your appearance and how both in the written fashion and the physical fashion really makes up a big deal of that is that person that's trying to get you to come to a class is he a fit individual does his gear look squared away and purpose driven like you said is his comment section and the captions on his posts well written and intellectual or is he just rambling with poor punctuation and spelling. So I I definitely think you can tell a lot just by, you know, first appearance. Oh yeah. I mean, I can see, you know, somebody puts on full kit and I can instantly tell like whether or not they are a professional, Mm -hmm. you know, like a simple thing of is your plate carrier actually correctly fitted up to you? Oh, that shit drives me nuts. Or is your rear plate bag sitting halfway down your spine? Um, you know, simple things like that. Like, you know, where where are your pouches? How are your magazines set in your pouches? Like, oh, there are little things that we can just look at. Okay, this person knows how to set up and run their equipment. They've clearly done it. Um, even if it's new equipment, mm-hmm. you know, like they may have just bought a brand new setup. But you can look at it. You have a really good idea of whether or not that person is a professional. And when I say professional, um, I'm not just referring to like whether or not they're in the law enforcement, in the military. It's like, does this person actually care about their equipment Mm -hmm. that they have put the time and effort, not just to what they bought, but how they actually put it together. A little thing I see on social media a lot that drives me nuts is pack straps pack straps that are just like all loose and like hanging down to their knees. That's that stuff drives me nuts. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah. all right, let's, uh, let's dive into the meat and potatoes of the podcast, which is your bread and butter, you know, reconnaissance. I mean, if, if we want to, we can kind of start off with just a general overview of reconnaissance and, and your, you know, direct experience with it. Okay. So, uh, reconnaissance is, you know, putting it simply, right, it is to observe something, you know, collect information on it, and then report that information back. Mm-hmm. You know, that could be a person, it could be a place. Um, we boil recon down into three basic types of route, area, and zone. So 
route is fairly straightforward, right? You're looking at, you know, roads, trails, paths uh, that may already be established or potentially finding those paths uh, for someone else. Uh, an area recon would be something like, uh, well, a common task would be like finding, uh, finding a helicopter landing zone. Um, and, you know, maybe relating that to the civilian side could be finding parking. Mm-hmm. Right. I need to go. I need to go find a, where I can park uh, to go to that. And then a zone recon would be a very broad scope. Uh, so that would be like checking out you know, an entire city or an entire mountain valley. Um, they can be pretty large and it would encompass multiple like route and area recons, you know, checking out different points of key terrain so that would kind of be like if you're going to go on vacation and you're trying to gather information about the area to figure out like what points you want to go to um be kind of like planning for a uh, a zone recon Mm -hmm. in a sense so and, and you know if you talk to your standard infantrymen you know army or marine corps and then you compare what they do to like an army scouts and then, you know, Marine recon, everybody says, Oh, what I'm doing is best, or uh, you're doing this wrong. You're supposed to do it this way. You know, what do you feel like there's that much of a difference in the principles and execution of reconnaissance uh, across the general infantry uh, field? Or do you think it's just people kind of being nitpicky to be say, Oh, I'm better at doing this than this person. So there's definitely, I mean, even within Marine Reconnaissance, like you go team to team and each team has a slightly different way of accomplishing X task and, you know, like their way is better. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the, one of the disparagements, at least within the military or, you know, let me go even tighter with my true scope uh, within the Marine Corps is... An infantry squad is capable of conducting a reconnaissance patrol. It's a basic task. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, the scope of reconnaissance that an infantry patrol is going to conduct is going to be much smaller than that of the battalion sniper platoon. And the battalion sniper platoon's scope is going to be different than that of what the uh, marine reconnaissance teams are going to collect uh the sniper teams definitely like close the gap with some of their equipment capabilities but training wise uh it is different um can can you give everybody kind of a broad scope overview of what marine recon's purpose really is because i feel like that's probably not something a lot of people are familiar with when it comes to like the higher tier units Right. So um, the mission of Marine Reconnaissance is to conduct ground and amphibious reconnaissance, battlefield shaping, and uh, limited scale raids. So what all that means. Limited scale raids is, if you think of like direct action, that is a limited scale raid. It is conducting a planned attack with a planned withdrawal uh, on a target in a sensitive environment. So when a commander wants to limit collateral damage and there's a very specific objective, uh, it's not just like clear, right? We're just trying to clear bad guys from this piece of key terrain, but no, like there is a thing or a person that we want and we need to capture him. You know, that's a limited scale raid uh, and Marine reconnaissance trains to be able to conduct that. And then they use those skill sets to also provide uh, maritime interdiction when they're aboard uh, aboard ships with the marine expeditionary units. Battlefield shaping is the controlling of supporting arms, so close air support, uh, your indirect fire support. Um, that's a big part of battlefield shaping. There's some other stuff that goes into it. We start talking what big picture phase zero shaping operations, but primarily it refers to uh, controlling of supporting arms. Do you Ground, feel? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You no, know, I was say so. Amphibious reconnaissance um, is conducting reconnaissance 
essentially of the beach and the area both a little bit over the beach and into the water. So, you know, the beach itself, uh, hydrographic surveys, uh, you know, checking things on the hinterland. And then ground reconnaissance would be then to go, you know, truly over the beach, uh, into the bush and conducting what's needed. And then a really, a big thing that Marine reconnaissance trains for that uh, no other unit does within the Marine Corps. And these are other similar reconnaissance units uh, throughout the DOD that train for this, it separates them, is the long-term sustainability and conducting surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, reconnaissance is like, hey, go check that out, then report back to me what you saw. So it's like, you know, you go, you look at something, cool, maybe you write it down, take a picture, you go right back, like, here, here's, here's what I saw. Mm -hmm. The surveillance aspect would be like, okay, go there, find the thing, confirm it's there, and then sit there and watch it and develop a pattern of life, mm -hmm. right? And then report, be able to report that back in as real time as possible. Do you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you, because uh, obviously you served through the introduction of MARSOC, this is a little off topic. Do you feel like the introduction of MARSOC kind of stepped on the toes of recon at all when they were first introduced, or was it really not much of a of a difference felt? No, it wasn't stepping on the toes. Um, in typical Marine Corps fashion, it there were things that were like a really great idea that were executed in a less than ideal fashion. That is very typical, you're right. <laughs> so, you know, we had we had Marine De Detachment 1, um, which was, you know, a bunch of, of force guys from 1st and 2nd Force, and they came together, you know, they did the little mini selection, and they formed this unit that was essentially the test bed mm -hmm. for Marine Special Operations. When I came into Force Recon, uh, the debt had been up and running for... Um, I think a little over a year. I think they had gotten two deployments in in that time frame. Uh, and initially, you know, the group of guys that I was going through the uh, the initial training with were like, "That's that'll be the next step." You know, we're we're gonna get into first force and we're gonna go into platoons and you know we're gonna work for a while and then like once we've kind of cut our teeth and and made a name for ourselves that would be the next step is to, is to try out for, for debt one. But then we started hearing that they were going to bring all of force recon into SOCOM. We're like, okay, cool. And, uh, so a couple years later, I am, you know, heading out the door on my first deployment with force recon. And they're like, Hey, the whole thing got approved. Like we're going to SOCOM. So it's like, okay, cool. Like, so we'll deploy, and when we come back, you know, I just figured, like, somebody would just go out and paint, you know, open parentheses, SOCOM, close parentheses, under the first force reconnaissance sign. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just thought that would be the only change. And then we would just have a little more funding and, you know, potentially more work. Uh, but that's not what happened. What happened mm -hmm. is, you know, they decided on this whole construct. Um, they dissolved at one, and they stood up. Uh, Second Marine Special Operations Battalion uh, in September of 2006, and then shortly thereafter, uh, whether it was September, October, they stood up First Marine Special Operations Battalion um, out on the West Coast, and General Mattis and maybe some other folks identified that if they let all the Force Recon guys get pulled into this MARSOC thing that they would lose everyone in the Marine Corps that knew how to and had experience conducting deep ground reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. um, and for the listeners, deep ground reconnaissance is essentially being able, when you are so far forward that there is no support, there is no artillery, there are no mortars, there's no quick reaction, um, and you may not even have 
close air support because you are so far out there that nothing can reach you or range you. And if something goes wrong, you are going to have to move yourself very, very far uh, in order to get to a place where you can gain some support. Um, probably one of the more popular, although I don't really know how many people have still heard it these days, but when I was younger, uh, Bravo 2-0. So if anyone's familiar with the story of Bravo 2-0, um, that's a good example of you know conducting deep ground reconnaissance. Uh, so they're like, hey, we're going to lose all these Marines that, that know all this stuff and have this experience. Um, and they didn't want to do that, so they made a deal, and uh, some guys were held in, you know, big Marine Corps and transferred over to the uh, their geographic recon battalion. So I was first force out of Camp Pendleton. So, you know, I'm out on ship, and one day my team leader walks into the birthing on ship, and he's like, hey, we, we belong to first recon. And I was like, you, you mean first force recon? He was like, no, <laughs> first recon. I'm like, is that what the SOCOM thing is being called? Like, we're just first recon now? I was like, did all of recon? He's like, no, no, no. First recon battalion is still a thing. And we now belong to first recon battalion. I'm like, this isn't funny, dude. Like, I don't, I don't understand the joke, but I don't dig it. He's like, I'm not making a joke. Uh, and he didn't really have much more for me at that point. But later on, he kind of explained to me what I just said about, you know, the whole generals and deep recon i mean who knows what else whatever the answers were but that was the answer that you know i got uh so yeah technically at that point we were part of first recon battalion uh they formed a delta company for all the uh old force hats um we maintained the moniker of first force reconnaissance company for the rest of the deployment and uh when we came off the deployment, came off the boat, we reported into, you know, entirely different uh, place on Camp Pendleton, uh, checking into first recon, which was uh, interesting. And yeah, I uh, that was just kind of how it was. And, uh, you know, I'll, I would say probably about two thirds of force guys, you know, ended up within first or second MSOP. And then there was a third of us that, uh, you know, ended up, at one of the recon battalions, you know, in this newly formed Delta company. Uh, and then it just, there was a whole, there was, there's, and there's still confusion um, about who is what and does what. Uh, I was going to say, I, I did not experience the transition, but f from everything I heard through the years, it sounds like everything and all of it involved was kind of a, you know, a cluster for quite a while. Yeah. So I, I can't really speak too much to what happened on the East coast. I know on the West Coast, um, they brought in a lot of people that uh, we would, you know, just very simply coin uh, recon haters um, as far as the command structure went um, to the point, you know, talking to some guys who were there, who were plank owners, and then they left as they possibly could. And they're like, you know, we'd have formations and this major would come out and you know, he's the EXO or OPSO or something like that. And he'd be like, you know, I don't like recon Marines. And it's like, dude, you're speaking to a formation of 0321 card carrying reconnaissance Marines. Like they were still recon Marines. It was mm. still their MOS. They didn't create the uh, 0372 critical skill operator MOS until like 20, I don't know, 13, 2012, something like that. <clears throat> uh so there's just a lot of bad blood in there, and uh, they they tried to mimic um, a structure that we had on the Mew where you'd have the force reconnaissance platoon, you would have the platoon from the local battalion recon, and then we would take a platoon from the infantry uh, that was still and is usually still referred to as the trailer platoon. And you know we use them as the security element on raids, and then some of the guys we would bring into the target as part of the support element. So like while we're clearing, if we come across somebody that needs to be detained, we just cuff them, you know, kind of throw him to the back of the stack to uh, you know the grunts that are, are trailing us, and be like, all right, bring this dude back to the dirty pit, and you know we would keep clearing, and they would handle that stuff for us. Mm -hmm. um, so they wanted that again, but they tried to create like a whole other company or something like that. And then 
SOCOM was like, no, that's not what we asked you to do. And so they took all these, you know, infantry guys that they had pulled from first Marine division. Um, and they were, you know, handfuls of like really good Marines that the division didn't want to give up, but you know, didn't have a choice. And then there were a good handful of Marines that like, well, no, we're not going to give you our good guys, but you can have this fucktard. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry. The story of every unit. Now it's all right. Yeah. It's this like you can have this guy. Yeah. It's like you can have, you can have this fucking guy. And uh, so you had this wide disparagement of talent. And it was all based off like record screenings. You know, there was no actual selection. There was no true vetting. It was like, does he have a high rifle score and a first class, you know, fitness test score? It's like, yeah, sure. Uh, and then they were just, instead of being sent back to their units, they were just made new special operators. They were just rolled into the special operations battalion. And now they, by sheer dumb luck, were also like special operators. Um, yeah, I feel so like that lot, was... Yeah, a lot of that stuff kind of got around and it was like... For me and, and some of the other guys that you know had been in the force reconnaissance companies beforehand, and you know we felt kind of, kind of shunned. Like, you know, this is kind of bullshit that you know we were not, we're not a part of this new thing when we should be. And then you hear about some of these stories, and then you know I'm sure there's not as much truth to it as uh, as I've been led to believe. But it's still, it's like it just sounds like a lot of nonsense, and so there's a lot of bitterness. But I was like, all right, well, you know. If that's that's how it is, like I'll I had orders to third recon um, after coming off that deployment. I was like, you know, I'll I'll get back, I'll get back to West Coast, and maybe I'll look at it. And then they started having a selection. I was like, you know, do I really need like it feels dumb to go take a selection and go back to a place I just was like where I belong. Um, and by the time I kind of got over some of my own my own pettiness and everything else. Uh, I was apparently too senior. So I remained a good old recon Marine. Well, let's, I kind of want to talk about, because the civilian world obviously is not familiar with how reconnaissance is supposed to be conducted in its true purpose. And I, and I thought back to, one of your posts on a chest rig that you had, I think it was like 14 mags on this chest rig. and uh, 12, yeah. It was a 12, yeah. And you talked about deep ground reconnaissance and how you don't have any support and everything. And I remember back to that post where people were like, they, they couldn't wrap their mind around why you had so many magazines on a rig that was meant for you to wear during X reconnaissance operation. So I, I kind of want to talk about some of your biggest pet peeves um, as far as like misconceptions of recon for the internet, for those that, you know, just really never have experienced this. Yeah. So I will also say like, you know, right off the bat, just because you put on a chest rig, that is not recce. Uh, it's not. You put, you put bipod, bipods on your rifle. That is not recce. You put, you know, a scope on your blaster. That is not recce. Those are just accessories and it's just gear. My entire life is a lie. I know, I know. So, uh, and I actually, I've gotten this argument with like, you know, some infantry guys because you the, you know, the issue kit is like you get your plate carrier and you have that like tops chest rig that's supposed mm-hmm. to click into it. They're like, oh, we use that. So if we do a recon patrol, and it's like, if you were doing a recon patrol as an infantryman, there is a high degree of enemy contact still. Yeah, and you should not be putting yourself in a lower PPE posture just because you're doing a quote unquote reconnaissance patrol. Mm -hmm. Um, You can absolutely do because the reconnaissance is just a task, right? The reason that dedicated reconnaissance assets, whether it be Marine recon snipers, uh, anybody like that will wear, you know, just simple load bearing gear instead of, armor is it offsets the weight of the added weight that goes on our backs that is going to not only sustain us in the field for longer uh, but then all the extra communication observation equipment we have to carry to conduct the mission mm-hmm. 
it helps with cooling uh, and a lot of other things. And because we have done the assessment that the risk of contact is low and that we are going to be taking painstaking uh, steps to ensure that. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of field craft that goes into we place a very high premium on camouflage, on concealment, on actually taking, like, I get a lot of briefs when I was in the infantry. It's like, yeah, we're going to take it. It was like a, a check in the box to say it, that we will use a cover to concealed route. And granted, this is Camp Pendleton, so, like, you know, you're kind of never covered and concealed because everything's pretty barren and, mm -hmm. you know, mountainous. But it's like we keep saying we're going to take covered and concealed routes just, like, because. But when you are infiltrating to conduct a reconnaissance and surveillance mission, you really are going to take covered and concealed routes. Uh, even if that means it takes you a lot longer to get to the target than if I were to take a more direct route, I am going to go in the ways that no one else is going to go so that I can remain undetected. Um, and I, so that's and I, why we wear the load-bearing equipment instead of the armor. And I've had this discussion with a lot of, like, even my local guys or just guys on Instagram or whatever it is, that people, I don't, I feel like, don't actually understand the low presence aspect of that and what that truly means. Like, if I have to tell somebody, no, you can't bring your tent or your blue hammock with you yeah. on this, t like, you're not just setting up a hammock and a campfire because you're stopping for the night. Like, that's, that's not how this works. Yeah. I mean, I did that, uh, you know, I did the uh, YouTube video for the Orion Training Group channel about, you know, packing your ruck. And it was how to pack your ruck like a force recon marine. And uh, one of the comments, he got really upset about my, my hygiene kit and uh, the clothes I was packing. Because you have all these jackets and socks, but you have no underwear or spare shirts. And I didn't see all kinds of baby wipes. They must call you pig pen. I'm like, no, they don't because everyone's just as dirty as I am. Mm-hmm. Because you're not packing spare clothes. You are packing the minimum of what you absolutely need. You know, pack light, freeze at night. It is both a guide and a warning. Mm -hmm. You know, you will bring out the absolute bare minimum you possibly can to survive. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you thrive depends on your level of training and your toughness, your grit. I mean, it really does come down to that. But, you know, like when we go to the field and this isn't really something. Um, so I try and paint the picture for people who haven't haven't served in the military or combat arms. But, you know, as infantrymen, I would go to the field and whether we trucked out or we hiked out, we would get to the training area and it'd be like, OK, this is the bivouac area. Everybody drop your packs in a nice, neat little platoon formations. And, you know, the company would sit up some cami netting and that was the CP and they would have their stuff set up in there. And then we would go train, whether it was we're going to go out and do squad size patrolling. If we're on a range, you know, whatever, if we were doing squad operations, we would meet in the bivouac area and then we would do our patrols and then our packs, our rucks would be brought to us in a Humvee and we would bivouac at our last objective for the night, get up the next morning, pack it up, throw our packs back in the truck, and then we would continue our squad operations and just living out of our assault packs. And, like, we would actually patrol and, like, meet our rucks at a certain point for, like, lunch. We'd pull our MREs out of our rucks. As a reconnaissance Marine, you don't just go to the field. You insert into mm -hmm. the field. Like, yeah. you go to the field, it's, it's a mission. From the moment... You step foot on your insert platform. If you leave the battalion area to go to the airfield to load aircraft, like you're on mission mm -hmm. and you insert into the field, you patrol, you get to a hide site and you begin your actions on and you maintain those actions on for as long as you're going to be in the field. And you commonly, it's a week, not mm -hmm. a full week, like insert Monday night, extract early Friday morning, you know, and come out and then you build from there and it's where you're going out for two weeks and there is no 
admin bivouac. There is no one bringing you chow. You sit down, you're around, you hang out. Like you will conduct resupply, uh, but everything is tactical from start to finish, mm-hmm. and it's that seemingly very simple differentiation is what kind of creates that separation between you know at least the marine corps the reconnaissance marine and the infantry marine and i think even a big aspect to that as far as like the civilian mindset of the field in general i think i'll if you take somebody you're like what's the longest you've ever gone without showering and they're like oh i went camping this one time i went two and a half days without showering like i mean not showering for three or four weeks at a time i think puts into a real perspective what the expectations are and everything else just makes sense from that yeah um i mean that that, it showed like you know when we went into iraq for the push to baghdad it was the first day of the invasion and i changed my socks again and i was like holy crap i have one more pair of clean socks because i (laughs) changed them I changed them twice in the assembly area and I had changed them twice that day uh, because we were wearing the the, uh, rubber Mm -hmm. uh, mop over boots. So my feet were just sweating like crazy. And I was like, I'll just change my socks. Uh, Because every other time it was like, yeah, we're going to the field for a week and, you know, we'll be out and we'll be done. And worst case scenario, I have to wear, you know, nasty socks for maybe two days before I can go back to the rear and get fresh ones. And I was like, holy crap, I have one more pair of clean socks and I'm not really sure how I'm going to clean the ones that I have. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the hell am I going to do? And then, yeah, I didn't, I don't, I I can't tell you when I showered. I don't think I showered in the push until after Baghdad and we withdrew to uh, Ad Diwania and there were showers there where like I took an actual shower up to that point it was like you try to wipe off with baby wipes here and there but you're just you're just dirty yeah after after a random point it's just like this is I'm not doing anything yeah I mean we and we definitely learned it was like we didn't know enough we didn't know a whole lot so we all learned like okay baby wipes are gold bring lots of baby wipes. So when uh, the battalion redeployed to Iraq, uh, you know, months later after returning, uh, everyone brought like baby wipes. And, you know, I went out and I bought like a, you know, camp soap or like you do the stuff where you don't need the water. It's just a powder you put in your Mm -hmm. hair. Um, I bought stuff like that. So, you know, when I wasn't out in the field and I was back in a rear area, uh, I would be able to, the hygiene and you know i figured out ways to clean socks and, and things like i packed it a lot more socks uh so some you know things we learn but uh yeah like and it's also things i've commented about before is you have to become comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. um and you know when i post about that there are a couple of people like that doesn't make any sense like yeah it, at face value it doesn't it it just sounds like an oxymoron but the reality is that you have to become comfortable being in unpleasant situations Mm -hmm. and that's what being in the field is it's you know when the sun goes down that is lights out there is no turning on lamps and things like that if you turn on a light it better be a red lens and you better have it covered Mm -hmm. that's another big thing that people just can't seem to wrap their minds around is that not even necessarily that they, they have to just use red light, but it's just light discipline in general. Like you shouldn't just be standing up, walking in circles around your patrol base or whatever the hell it is with your red light on. Like you need to yeah. be disciplined with your light use. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, I don't mean to denigrate the infantry when I, I speak to my experience. I know things have changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that, you know, currently the guys are making a lot of strides to really tighten up their field craft, but you know, when I was in the grunts in the early 2000s, like, there was no, like, hey, cover up that red lens. It was like, oh, you're using a red lens. Cool. <laughs> right? If you, use, if you like, you you messed up and, like, you, you know, your red lens fell off. And this was still, I am this old. There weren't headlamps. So we were all using either the, uh, 
angled head moonbeams, as we called them, like the old beams. GI issue, you know, nine degree head flashlights. Screw off or, the cap and put the red lens over it. Yeah. Or, <laughs> you know, if like you were high speed uh, and didn't waste all your money on dip and beer, you went to the PX and you bought the little mag light. So you'd have to carry the big bulky D cell battery moonbeam, you know. So that was me, of course. I was high speed. I had a, the camouflage bodied mag light. True. Right. And <laughs> but it was like, yeah, it, you could walk around, just shine a red lens. I, I remember this. We were linking up. We were practicing company operations, and we had to link up with another fire team that was our guide back in our friendly lines. And my team leader was like. Our squad leader was like, yeah, just shine the red lens and do three, two, one with a red lens, like, like a kilometer away. Like we're just <laughs> going to flash the red light and it's totally cool because there's a red lens. And then we're back in like our company, you know, bivouac area and everyone's red lenses everywhere, walking around, doing everything. But it wasn't a red lens. And so, yeah, so it's fine. Like, you know, the, the, the bad guys can't see the red lens. Only we can see the red lens. And then I got to recon. <laughs> And I mean, even I went to the, the sniper platoon first, and it was like, okay, like light discipline's important, but we were kind of lazy with it. And then I'm in the basic reconnaissance course, and I'm reading a map. I've got three ponchos piled on top of me, but the instructor can still see like a pinhead of red light, and he calls a contact drill. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we got, we need to get really serious with this here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and and it's those levels of patrolling disciplines that do separate, you know, your conventional units from the more specialized units that have people who have been assessed and selected and specially trained and you know receive a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of amazing dudes, and in the conventional side. You know, there's a lot of this whole like soft worship thing that I've been seeing, you know, on Instagram. And believe me, like not every dude in soft is is worth that uh, admiration. But there are a lot of really good people on the conventional side, and that's you know we need that. Mm -hmm. You can't lose everybody to the special operations because in your conventional side just looks like a bunch of bobos. Yeah. So and transitioning over to the conventional from here, I kind of want, I kind of want to focus on conventional standard reconnaissance and stay away from the more, you know, what you're used to force recon style stuff, just so we can try to relate it to yeah, yeah. the listeners to the best of our ability. So it, as far we kind of start at the beginning, you know, when we start with reconnaissance from your experience, is it, is it pretty standard as to doctrine? You know, you do, you have, you know, identify your objective or your mission. You have your SMEAC. You know, you begin the planning, all that kind of stuff. Is 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 the five paragraph order from where you come from pretty standard across the board? Oh yeah, uh, Marine Recon. We still utilize uh, you know the Marine Corps planning process. Good old MCPP. <laughs> um, you know, within within SOF, um, they don't follow. That process, they follow more joint doctrine, and it's more about developing a con ops uh, concept of operations. But yeah, in Marine Recon, we follow Marine Corps planning process. Um, I find it very useful, and I'm talking to some of the guys, you know, who have this other way, and it, it's it's same thing, but it's, it's named differently. So mm -hmm. I, I find young Shmiak. Marines when they go over to young Marines, like they they go into something new, and you know they want it to not be the Marine Corps anymore. It's like, no, no, it's, it's different. Like it's, it's really not, you, you know, the terminology has changed and you're not quite looking at, it, but you're, you're performing the same steps, right? Mm -hmm. We all just have a, a different name for the same friggin' tub of vanilla ice cream. But, yeah. uh, yeah, I, I so find, we still follow that. I find the five paragraph order, which me act, whichever one you really want to refer to it to, to be like, like, honestly, one of the best things for small unit leadership that I think the modern times really kind of developed. I mean, I was yeah. I was talking, I was teaching the whole Schmiak process at the very intro level to some of Wandering Hoosiers guys when they came over and trained with us uh, mm -hmm. back at the end of 2022, and they yeah. they were mind blown 
they were like, this this just makes so much sense in the order it's in. And I, I think, I mean, you can dumb down a schmack or you can go into as much detail as you want. And I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the critical components is keeping it simple. And when you go to schools, uh, you know, like squad leaders, uh, you know, BRC, although we, we kind of changed the whole process, or sniper school, it's like they want you to write all this detail, you know, down to like the point man will take a knee on his right knee facing the 12 o'clock based on the, you know, direction of movement, and blah, 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 blah. Like that's too much. That is way, way mm-hmm. too much. But sometimes in schoolhouse environments, you know, they want that extra detail because you may not be briefing that order to them. They may just be reading it. So they want the extra so that they can really see where your mind's at. Or sometimes it's just to make you have more work. I say officers just, they just like briefs. Yeah. But the the reality of those orders is they should be very, like we call them a brief. We should make it. So it should be as brief as possible. If we're standing around the train model, for an hour to discuss, you know, a reconnaissance patrol or a squad attack, like we're doing too much, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that is way too many moving parts and it's all going to go bad. Um, so that was a big thing that I found, you know, in development was really making, because I got used to that whole like, well, it needs to be super detailed because that's what, you know, it's always wanted in schools and this and that. And then you know, I hearing all these people brief all these things. Well, I should make it really detailed and drawn out because that just makes it seem like a good plan. And then I started having like holes shot in my plan and like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you even briefing me about this? Mm-hmm. Um, and then going to, honestly, going to infantry unit leaders course um, was a real big one because I got a much better understanding of a lot of the things within uh, the five paragraph order and it really let me actually condense the whole thing and just get through it a lot faster really focusing on the meat and potatoes of what I needed to when I actually briefed my guys mm-hmm. and how from the OPSEC perspective and this is rather conventional still how did once you're you know you know, on foot, you know, you're, you're now in mission. How did you guys protect, uh, OPSEC as it was, as far as critical information and any information you took from your mission briefing and whatnot from the recon perspective? Because obviously, you know, we talk about, we want to try and plan for low contact. Uh, At least you should, your, Mm -hmm. your recon objective shouldn't be contact, obviously. So, but in the event that it is, you know, how do you protect OPSEC um, from a lot less of a support perspective? So we, so to, you know, mitigate the damage uh, from compromise is you have to have a destruction plan Mm -hmm. and that destruction plan, you know, should be tiered of, you know, when do we destroy certain things? How are we going to destroy those certain things? And you have to design these destruction methods to be like somebody's going to need to do this while they're being shot at and trying to return fire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has to be simple. And, you know, so it's like having a, uh, a thermite and a claymore, you know, prime together inside your ruck, you pop some time fuse, you pop that, you know, if you have to drop ruck, you're going to pop that and that will destroy the contents of your rug and, you know, potentially create a barrier against the enemy, but you're also going to be grabbing your go bag. It has like your absolute mission essentials and we're going to keep breaking contact. And then if it still looks like, Hey, we're probably going to get overrun, you know, you have another thermite grenade and you're going to pop that and burn your go bag. And then you're going to throw your, uh, sensitive items that should be kept in, you know, somewhere uniformly located that you can just like grab it like a map case that's out of your cargo pocket. You throw that in the burning pile and then we continue to try and E and E and now you've lost, you know, all the information that you didn't send 
which is why that whole reporting thing is huge because if you just collect and hold on to it, no one knows until you physically bring it out. Um, and then if you're compromised and it gets lost, then you know the mission was for not entirely. But if you can report it, then it's not a complete loss. But you, know, you have all these levels down to like disassembling your weapon and scattering the pieces and, you know, scattering the parts of your, you know, load bearing gear until you're left with just like the bare essential survival kit on your person. And you are just trying to run your ass off and survive off of a tiny little survival pocket size survival kit and a pocket knife, hoping that you don't get captured. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point to drive home to everybody that's listening, whether you're in the military now or, you know, you're that, you know, civilian organization, everybody in the squad or everybody in the fire team, whatever unit size you're talking about, everybody doesn't need all of the critical information. You know, your squad leader and then your team leaders have information, critical notes that they wrote down from the briefing, coordinates of certain stuff. But, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry shouldn't just be carrying around a ton of information. Yeah. Um, and I guess maybe more to the point of you know, your original questions like uh so maps mm -hmm. you know we create an overlay which is you take a piece of you know acetate paper that's clear and you would have your route on there but you don't bring that out with you on patrol you turn that in to hire and they're going to put that on a map in a much more protected sphere so they can see you know what your plan route is and they can when you call in a checkpoint like oh, okay cool like that's where they are mm -hmm. um and I've seen some teams, you know, again, I spent four years as a basic recon instructor. So, you know, so many student teams would, you know, draw their route on their map as a, like the point man or the team leader and be like, erase that. Like, you do not write on your map, you know, for a long term. If you've got to, you know, record an azimuth, if you're trying to shoot a resection and you're going to record your azimuths and do the math, like, cool. And then you erase it. Mm -hmm. You figure out where you are and you erase anything and you leave nothing on your map. And there are some people who even went so far as to say that, like, they would not allow their team to have their maps folded uh, to the area where you are working. Mm. Like, it should just be, like, full, like in its default folded form and then you open it up to where you need it to and then put it back. Uh, I never went that far because it's like if we get captured, we're we're going to be captured and they're going to realize we're in that area. So yeah, like you're not really giving away much. Yeah, they find our map is also looking at that area. It's like, well, that's where we capture them. So of course. See, that's um, why I like laminated maps to the best of my ability because if yeah. you have you know the little markers or whatever, if you need to, you can pull out your map, lick your finger, and just start messing up everything on the laminated map. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we don't write anything on maps. Uh, you know, there were some teams who would come up with like codes. I would just use, you know, shorthand. So uh, if I were unable to destroy my reports or my logs, um, it would be it would be difficult for somebody to read because you're trying you'd have to get it to somebody who could translate, you know, to English, and then looking at you know my chicken scratch because my handwriting's not the greatest. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be writing most of this stuff after I've only been sleeping for three hours a day. And those three hours are spread out in hour long blocks. So it's going to be awful. And then I'm writing my own shorthand, mm -hmm. which I know is confusing because I would hand these reports to my radio operator to type up and he'd be like, what the, boss, is what the hell is this? <laughs> He was like, you change, you change it. He's like, I understood you, and you changed your shorthand again. And I'm like, well, it, that's that's what this means now. He's like, okay, please don't change it again. This patrol, I'm like, I will try not to, you know. <laughs> so it's you, you do little things, um, you know, uh, like the GPSs. Uh, I would not, I would not put routes. I would not allow my guys to put route in their GPSs. Uh, I would allow them to put uh, the objective in their GPS, and we would mark uh, we would mark our long halts uh, in a specific way, so that we would always know where the uh, rally point was. Mm -hmm. um, 
but also keeping enough points in there that, you know, if someone were captured and they opened up that GPS, they would have all the long holds, so those positions would be compromised, but they wouldn't know which specific one the team was going to, but the team would be able to read it and uh, understand which point to go to. Mm-hmm. So some small things like that um, to try and protect that information uh, in the event of compromise, but again, that destruction plan is also really big. But again, you know, you want to win the fight left of bang, so there's a lot of preparation and hard work that goes into avoiding that uh, pretty much at all costs. Mm-hmm. Where does where does recon start? What what is the very first part of this of this whole process? And it starts with identifying that you don't know something, mm-hmm. and you want to. Uh, and again, you know, it could be a, a, a litany of things. You know, it could be like, man, <clears throat> what are my neighbors doing over there in that barbecue? Like they're there's a whole lot of laughing and music playing and it's kind of loud. And what are they doing over there? Mm-hmm. Right. You want to know cause you're a, you're a nosy ass neighbor. So you want to find out also. So what do you do? You think about RK. Well, I don't want them to see that I'm looking because I wasn't invited and I don't want them to see me and you know, them realize that I'm bitter about that. So I don't want to be seen. I want to see what they're doing and I don't want to be seen. Okay. Where can I go within my house that I can see into their backyard and figure out what they're doing? You know, and you think, ah, oh, well, maybe I can go upstairs. No, no, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Oh, I'm going to have to go outside. Okay, but I don't want them to see me go outside, so I'm going to have to go out the side door, not the back door, and I'm going to have to walk around, you know, the fence and then go stand behind the shed, and then I can peek around the shed. And then I can see into the yard and I can see what they're doing in their barbecue where they didn't invite me. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you go out, you look and you see what they're doing and you see they're having so much fun without you. And because you're a really lousy neighbor, you decide that they're being too loud. So you're going to report and you're going to take a concealed route back inside your house and you report, you call the cops, file a noise complaint. And that's why you have no friends, but you've also conducted an effective reconnaissance. Wow. I'm sure some of the listeners can probably relate to that. <laughs> um, but it's it's funny yeah. you start to tailor that towards a civilian because it's something I want to talk about. And I kind of want to break this into two different categories between the civilian and the tactical civilian. Um, yeah. And for the civilian side, I kind of want to focus on just like, you know, preparedness. You know, what are some big aspects – the general preparedness community and, you know, the more concerned citizen can take away from the general idea and practice of reconnaissance. I mean, we've kind of hit on it a little bit, um, but I feel like, like I'm, obviously you're familiar with area studies and whatnot. Area mm-hmm. studies in turn require you to conduct reconnaissance. Yep. And I feel like that's something a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. I mean, you know, things to look at would be, uh, you know, where are the local game lands, right? Because, like, where I live in North Carolina, we live under the, you know, threat every year of hurricanes. And the last big one we had was Hurricane Florence. Um, and after that hurricane rolled in, because it rained so much and there was so much flooding, uh, we became very, very isolated. You know, we really couldn't get a lot of help in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, now, had that gone on for like, you know, a ridiculously long time and all that, like knowing where the game lands are, because I know that that game land is there, which means there's a large swath of undeveloped woodland where there are going to be a higher concentration of woodland critters that taste really good after they've been murdered and cooked. So I should know where those are. And then from there, I would refine my reconnaissance to actually doing like some game scouting and finding out where within that game land can I go to have the highest chances of success of taking game so that I have food. Mm -hmm. I can check out waterways, you know, what are viable waterways that I could use to travel in and out of the area potentially if I had to or that I can use to resupply 
water. You know, if I there's issues with water, can I resupply from this water? And then part of that is also, you know, what is upstream from this source? Like, will this source be contaminated by the event that is forcing me to look for water that isn't coming out of my faucets? Um, uh, you know, all the little things of infrastructure that we come to rely on, like you, you can conduct reconnaissance on it. It doesn't have to be like all like super duper sneaky and, you know, putting chest through. Sometimes it's just a phone call, right? You can just make a phone call and inquire about something like, Hey, you know, what's the, are the substations protected against, you know, what is the natural disaster that most likely occurs in your area? Mm -hmm. Um, some things like that. Uh, you can find that stuff out. You're going to make phone calls. A lot of stuff you can find with just you know basic internet searches. I was going to say maps, uh, Google Maps specifically. You can do a lot of quote unquote reconnaissance without even leaving your house. Yeah. Uh, map reconnaissance um, is huge, yeah. and I think that's really undervalued. Yeah, map and imagery reconnaissance, and you know we use that when we are planning to actually conduct, you know a ground or amphibious reconnaissance mission, we do extensive map and imagery reconnaissance to really make sure we are planning our routes out well, we're planning where we're setting up our observation posts. So like you, you need to take advantage of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, another one would be, you know, knowing where, you know, the grocery stores are and the pharmacies and the dollar stores and all these little stores and all the routes to and from them. Mm -hmm. You know, if this way is blocked by trees or a riot, you know, or in an unruly group that is, you know, attempting to take advantage of the situation, they're setting up, you know, a, a blockade of some kind. How do I get around that? You know, I look at all the main roads and I look at, you know, doing my map and imagery studies and driving through the areas. It's like, oh, I think there's a Jeep trail that might actually connect these two roads. You know, mm -hmm. so let's go check that out. Like, is that a thing? And then, you know, maybe is that in a place where maybe we can maintain that Jeep trail just enough that our group, you know, knows it's there and we can make use of it. But it's not so obvious that people just start randomly, you know, turning up and down it to make a new shortcut home. You know, little things like that uh, that you could do for that, the general preparedness. Mm -hmm. And this go and there's another aspect to this as well. If you conduct you know, an area study and you record that information, you should treat that as sensitive information. Don't just print it out and leave it on your desk for everyone to see. Or, you know, even you could even take it as far as not just saving it under the documents on your laptop. Put it on a flash drive and then put that in, you know, a hidden place in your house or print it off and put it in a secure safe in your house. Treat you know, some of that information, though it may not seem super tactical and all that kind of stuff, treat that information like OPSEC because even those practices will carry over to other aspects later. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, if, you know, you have a group and you, know, you build these products of things, you would want to protect it. Um, but I would also say, like, you, you have to be careful um, – in some of these things, uh, because if what you're doing could be construed as targeting, uh, that's where you start running into issues with Johnny Law. And yeah, and that's another, and, and all, all the bigger reason to take OPSEC very seriously because you don't want to handle things poorly and then it be perceived that you're up to no good when in reality you're just doing a basic prepper thing. Yep. Um, and if you are up to no good, you weren't very good at hiding it to begin with, and you were probably going to have a shitty plan. Yeah. Um, transferring over to the tactical civilian, because I, I feel like at this point, we can kind of distinguish that there is a portion of the community since probably, I'd say, 2021, um, that that's much different as far as the 2A community goes than anything else. It's people that are trying to learn you know, mission planning, you know, learn how to do reconnaissance, learn how to do actual community support that requires logistics and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of want to start to aim this towards this and I'll keep it rather on the vanilla side just so it's not misconstrued. Um, yeah. 
reconnaissance, even in its relation to responding to like natural disasters. If you're you're a prepared um, and organized civilian group, um, one of the big things that you know I've told my guys because everybody knows you know I lead my own local volunteer group of guys. We're not you know terrorists or anything. We're just dudes trying to help the community. Um, one of the big things I tell my guys and even other people that are trying to form groups is you can't just randomly decide to do stuff. You can't just randomly call everybody up one day and be like, Hey, something happened here. Look, we're just going to go. There has to be a methodical planning process to all that. So even if something is simple as responding to a natural disaster requires reconnaissance, send some guys ahead. What does that area's condition look like? What are the resources that those people in that community need? Um, You know, all of the same aspects of reconnaissance still apply, even though it doesn't involve holding a gun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after, so we stuck around for Florence, we made the call kind of last minute that uh, we weren't going to evacuate. We stayed. And uh, my dad actually came down because they had just bought a house in the area. And he was going to stay uh, outside kind of the range of the storm. But when he heard that we were, staying as well he's like well screw it. i'm just gonna drive to you guys and you know we'll ride or die together mm-hmm. and so you know the storm hit and once the storm had passed that's what we did we hopped you know got in my truck and we drove around we drove around our neighborhood first we went over to his home we drove around that neighborhood and uh at the time you know my best friend was living you know two doors down so he was doing the same thing with his family and we were determining, you know, what was the damage. So what kind of help could we expect to have to render people, you know? Mm-hmm. And then immediately it was like, was there anyone we were going to come across that was like in need of in need of immediate assistance right there on the spot? So, you know, I had, you know, tools and all kinds of stuff in my truck so we could do some immediate response if needed. But it was mostly to go around and see like, are we going to have to, you know, remove some trees because roads are completely impassable and who knows when crews are going to get to them? Mm. Are you know, we going to have to help get trees off of people's homes so they can throw a tarp over the roof and, uh, you know, prevent the water damage? Um, are we going to have to help people, you know, do this or do that? And we just kind of drove around, you know, we checked on, uh, big thing was we checked, the homes of people who had left, you know, they, uh, through Facebook and, you know, before and through text messages, people were like, Hey, you know, this is where I live. Would anybody mind checking on my home once the storm passes? And so we had a list of places that we had to go check out. And then once we had done a reconnaissance of their property it was, you know, get to a place where we had cell signal and then report like, Hey, you know, your fence is down here. Your fence is down here. There's a tree down over here, um, but, you know, there's no damage to your house or, you know, there's, you know, you got a gutter ripped off by a branch. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people give us, would then give us the codes to get into their homes through alarms so we could go inside and be like, yes or no, is there water damage inside? Um, And so, you know, it continued to build upon itself until it it reached that point where we no longer need to conduct reconnaissance. We have conducted all the reconnaissance we needed. We've gathered all the information that we have needed. Uh, and now we are actioning uh, this information we've aggregated as in going to these places and, you know, cutting trees off of roofs, removing trees off people's properties, getting them out of the roads, helping people patch their roofs, helping people move stuff out of, you know, areas that were water damage and, and all that. Mm-hmm. And even taking that a step further, let's talk about, um, you know, bigger groups, say a couple counties south of you, something big happened and you caught up all the boys. Say your boys are two or three squads. You're almost at a platoon size group. You know, you look at the maps or whatever and you're like, you know what, this is going to be our ORP right here in the middle of this big parking lot. This is where we're going. This is where we're going to set up our mini talk and we're going to stage all our supplies here, blah, blah, blah. You conducted no reconnaissance and you show up and that parking lot is completely underwater and it's no good. Now you've got, you know, two dozen vehicles with no backup plan because you didn't take that little bit of time 
to send, you know, a single vehicle forward and just check out the area before you decide to show up. Yep. Um, and, it, and the reconnaissance could even go over to even a little bit of the tactical side. You know, the big thing that we faced in 2020 was uh, riots from those that shall not be named. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do reconnaissance on something like that. You and a friend can get in a vehicle, low pro. You don't got to put your helmet on and your night vision, your plate carrier to drive downtown and see what's going on. But you and your buddy get in a car, you got your CCW, you know, you drive down to the outskirts of town. You may do a few passes on a few certain roads and just and see what's going on because you want to have knowledge for knowledge base. Um, you can do the same thing through social media. One of the biggest things I learned through 2020 was you can paint a really good picture on crowd movements and actions through social media. Huh. Yeah, people will, you know, report on themselves without even realizing or trying to. Snap maps, Snapchat maps was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest one because it always time stamp stuff um, and would give you like exact positions on roads where that post was made. So it was oh, really, wow. so it was really easy to be like, oh, you know. 32 minutes ago, there's a crowd of roughly 300 people on 4th Street, and you know they're starting to get a little rowdy, and there's no police presence. But then if you move forward three streets, you know, 26 minutes ago, same amount of people, but now there's police presence. You know, you can develop a time pattern, a timeline to that kind of stuff just from social media posts. Yeah, absolutely. Um. You got anything else kind of big recon wise uh, you kind of want to talk about that I may have failed to mention so far? Uh, I would just say, you know, a, a really big thing is uh, the discipline, mm-hmm. right? You have to be willing, like we talked about, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, uh, you know, the light discipline of not using a light, you know, so if you are trying to conduct like that more low vis where I'm just driving around, you know, if you have to find something in the car, you probably shouldn't turn on the pilot light. You should just be able to find it in the dark, which means that before you depart to go drive around to go see stuff, you should make sure you know where everything is in that car so that you can reach it, access it in the dark. Um, a lot, of, a lot of that discipline and even the discipline to do rehearsals. So, you know, we have our two guys that we want to send forward and, you know, go check out what's going on downtown or go see if that parking lot is viable. You know, it's like, hey, guys, uh, so we're going to send you go prep the vehicle and then, you know, make sure you do a couple of rehearsals for contingencies. You know, what happened, what, what, what is your plan, you know, if you roll to the wrong crowd and they start shooting at you? What's your plan if the crowd starts, you know, beating on the car with, you know, blunt objects? Uh, what if you run out of gas? What if you get stuck and have them go through some of those contingencies? Mm-hmm. Uh, that way they are indeed, you know, prepared. Uh, and then even again, before that, having the discipline to see what these things could be like do you actually can you change a tire can you make quick repairs on the vehicle can you do Mm self-recovery um and then going and then practicing that realizing that you may need to perform this skill in in an emergency and you don't have time to learn it in the emergency so you have to prepare for it beforehand and you have to practice it beforehand And it takes discipline because we are all very limited on time, especially when you are not in the military and you are not assigned to this, you know, unit that conducts this thing all the time. And your job is just train for it day in and day out until you deploy. You know, you have to find the time to work on these things to ensure that you have the skills needed before you need to utilize them. Mm -hmm. And that goes, I really want to drive that point home to, all of the listeners, uh, for some reason, I, I apparently have a lot of listeners in Eastern Europe. My YouTube channel loves Eastern Europeans for whatever reason. Um, obviously, you guys are dealing with a whole different issue over there. I can't stress enough, regardless of where you're a listener from, you do not be ashamed or 
be afraid or timid to, to do things now. Read, you know, you know, read, practice doing these things, do drills, talk this out with your buddies, talk it out with your family, whatever it is. Don't be ashamed to try and do this stuff now, um, especially even if you're just you know a, a, a civilian your entire life. Don't don't let that discourage you. You know you can still learn a lot, um, and you, you shouldn't be ashamed to to try and do any of this. Yeah, and and so many of these skills too. It's not it's not about shooting. It's not about how well you can put camouflage face paint on or how well you know you can put on load bearing kit. It's literally the things I mentioned, like being able to maintain a vehicle. Right, those are simple everyday kind of skills that a lot of us have learned to to neglect and overlook because we live in places where if my car breaks down you know i just call a tow truck and Mm -hmm. you know a tow truck driver like he's gonna know everything he'll be part mechanic like he'll be able to help me out he'll be able to fix it like i don't need to know this stuff but you do need to know this stuff so that you can help yourself because you probably don't need the tow truck you just need to realize that oh you know, I let my battery die or whatever, you know, I can jump myself if I have the right gear. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of just really super basic everyday skills that involve nothing that you would typically associate with the military, with guns and gear and camouflage. There's a lot of really easy, simple, like knowing how to use a pair of binoculars, right? That's super easy. And the next time you go out for a hike, you bring your binoculars so that way you can actually like see stuff. Because when you see that animal in the distance, it's not going to let you get close. And a lot of them, if you do get close, you're going to be unhappy about it. But you can use those binoculars to look at it a lot more closely with, while maintaining a safe distance. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things, the biggest takeaways you can take from any of this is... In, in regards to recon is you are your own support and sustainment in, in the aspects of reconnaissance. And especially for the civilians listening, you don't have, you know, infantry QRFs and an S6 shop and all of this crazy stuff. If you do, that's awesome. Good for you. Uh, but that's not the reality for a lot of people, even from just the general preparedness perspective. You may have a few family members or friends that are on board with you, but you're all you got. So you, you got to learn how to support yourself. And that goes for a very, very wide range of concern topics. Yeah. And then, you know, on the, that same token, you know, that goes back in some of the things you talked about in the very beginning, and, you know, things we push with the Ryan Training Group and, and my company, Maneuver Training Solutions. It's like, uh, go build your community, mm-hmm. you know, so you do have that support. And whether that support is, oh, crap, you know, something happened and I can't be in two places at once. Hey, Bob, can you pick the kids up from school? Mm -hmm. You know, to, oh, shit, something's happened. Hey, Bob, I need you to get the shovel because I got some some bodies to bury. You know, just like to go to that, that extreme, right? If you build community, then you will have that support structure because you may not have like a dedicated, you know, comm shop and an armory and logistics, but if you know enough people and you network and you build your community and everybody knows each other and is comfortable with each other and you, you know, like you see all those old movies with a small town, everyone knows each other, everyone's willing to help each other. Mm-hmm. You can build that. And then there's going to be somebody within that community who is going to be smart, you know, somebody who works in telecommunications can help you with those kinds of issues. Somebody who is a mechanic can help you with car troubles. Somebody who does web design or those computers, like they can help with all these little aspects, whether it's just a simple one-off, hey, I need a favor, to, hey, we just got our asses handed to us by a natural disaster. We need to start organizing, coming together, and you know, I need you to go do this, I need you to go do this, I need you to help me with that, and I need you two to go over here and do this. And now you have that support structure. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be, this kind of goes into a whole different topic, but people are so 
timid to take it to this level that that we're talking about it's about creating community because uh, unfortunately as sad as it is to say that sense of community and self-reliance and self-infrastructure and all that is seen as wrong or extreme these days and you just kind of got you just got to move past that and realize that the labeling and the name calling is, is not going to stop and that you should not let that you know limit what you're trying to do yeah and like i'm not even saying you should go out and build a militia you know in the the sense of how most people think of it, it was a bunch of weirdos and mismatched camouflage uniforms and you know bargain bin rifles like sure there are going to be people within your community who are who are into that they want to go to the range and shoot and there are going to be people who want to go out and like hey next weekend you know i want to go out and i just want to you know we're going to camp out and like really rough it for like two nights and then you'll have a handful of people who are probably like, yeah that'll be super cool right and some of them are going to try and you know be overly comfortable and that's fine like you keep doing it and they get more mm-hmm. comfortable being what they would normally deem as being uncomfortable you know but not everybody in your group is going to be you know a goon right and that's that's okay it, it's not about that but it is okay for the people who do want to go out and really get into their training because you are going to need that group you know mm-hmm. i'm very fortunate where i am I'm right outside Camp Lejeune, and in the area where I live, the overwhelming majority of people here are either current or retired uh, Marine Recon or Marine Raider. You know, there's a handful of SF guys. So this would be a really stupid town to come to and try to fuck with mm-hmm. uh, after a natural disaster. Uh, but you know, that won't be the case for everyone. You're not going to live in a neighborhood where you can throw a rock and hit a special operator. Mm -hmm. So finding those like-minded individuals who are willing to go out and to train, to take classes, to learn more, and then apply that to your training, um, because you're going to need, you know, a group of individuals that is capable of protecting the larger group. Mm -hmm. And you can't always rely on law enforcement because I'll go right back to Florence and, the only law enforcement that was around were the ones who didn't leave, right? Mm-hmm. The, the guys and gals who did not evacuate and they stayed in the area, whether by you know choice or they were forced to, and you still didn't see them for quite a few days because there was so much going on and so few of them and such limited access because of flooding. Uh, I didn't see law enforcement for days after Florence. Mm-hmm. Right. So if my whole thing was like, well, I'll just wait for law enforcement to fix a problem. That's not always going to be there. So you have to be prepared to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, for sure. And it kind of goes back to like what we were talking about, even with vetting instructors earlier is professionalism. Yeah. All of it. Like you said, yeah. don't be, don't be that weird cringe militia. That's wearing four different camouflage patterns and only goes to the flat range. Don't, don't do that. You know, Set if if you expect to step forward and help your community whenever things arise, and I'm not saying this all has to be matching camis and all this kind of stuff, but just have a general understanding of what professionalism looks like for what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. Whatever whatever that might be, that, that's a whole different. I got a video up on on YouTube if you really want to dive into it, but that's a whole different topic. Regardless, yeah. you can you can be. be you can appear professional and accomplish a lot. Yeah, I, I will say like uniformity, uniformity is, is an important thing. And without going down that rabbit hole, you know, just look at just look at Ukraine mm-hmm. where there's a little too much uniformity where both sides are wearing the exact same thing. <laughs> I know I can't uh, I can't tell them apart sometimes. Yeah. And so now you, you've got guys, you know, wrapping colored tape around themselves. Oh, it's and that's nuts. That's how we're identifying. Yeah, and it does. It's like that's not. It's like camouflage is not tactical, but yeah, it's like we stop wearing to, camouflage you know, if we're going to do that. <laughs> rapidly, you know, different, but at the same time, right? You know, a decent amount of uniformity, um, even if it's even if it's as simple as like you know, again, if you're going to wear OD green, wear OD green. Don't have like OD green pants 
and uh, you know, a multicam jacket, and then like some throwback Cold War era obscure camo, you know, hat on, right? Unless unless you're you know Bush plaid, and then you're all obscure Cold War <laughs> Bush camo, <plaid. laughs> right? Like, see, he's uniform. He looks good because he just like he's got the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right, it, it's an obscure camo, but he doesn't look like a nerd because he's uniform, mm-hmm. right? For sure. Um, any, I, I kind of threw this in at the end. I figured you would have some some wise words. What's what's the harsh reality? <sighs> the harsh reality is that despite the fact that a lot of people believe they want to learn reconnaissance, you know, the way that I did it. Uh, there is a reason that it is conducted by specialized units full of personnel who have been assessed and selected Mm -hmm. out of a group of candidates that represents less than 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. Right. It is not for everybody. Uh, having said that, that doesn't mean you are incapable of understanding some of the basics that we discussed in the podcast and going out, making sure that you're physically fit, making sure you're comfortable being in the outdoors, making sure you have your shit squared away, that you are put together, that you are coordinating within your group, you are building your community so you have that you know, inherent support structure back and forth, it needs to be mutual. Uh, so that you are capable of conducting, you know, some of these basic things to make sure that in the event of an emergency, you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your neighborhood, right? Everyone is going to be as prepared as possible. Uh, and then if we ever find ourselves in a situation where we still need some more information, we understand how to go about it in as low risk as possible. Blake, thank you for coming on. This has been—I think this has been really informative for a lot of people. I hope so. Uh, do you want to do a shout out to anybody? I know you've mentioned a few companies already, but if you want to give any formal shout outs. Oh uh, no, no formal shout out. I will just say, you know, once again, I um, I have my company, Maneuver Training Solutions. Uh, I operate in the Eastern Carolina area, and you know, so if you're in that area or you're willing to make the drive, as some people have, that's awesome. But definitely stay tuned to Orion Training Group uh, because we are doing as much as we possibly can uh, with the staff that we have to get stuff out there and make training available uh, across the whole gamut. So, you know, you want to learn small unit tactics out in the woods. You want to learn CQB. You want to get better at marksmanship. You want to learn communications. You want to learn medical uh, sustainment. We are pushing all that stuff, and it's going to start generating, you know, more headway with other other companies are going to follow suit. I guarantee mm-hmm. it. So um, definitely stay in tune with Orion Training Group. Um, get yourself trained, and yeah, stay dangerous. Awesome. Uh, for all of my normal listeners, for the, we have the company Instagram for ECT backup i took some extreme measures to hopefully separate it from everything that was a mess in 2022 so hopefully that stays up um if it goes down again i'm going to say i'm done with instagram and then in a month i'm going to make another one um so we'll go from so we'll go from there but you can check that back out it's going to be everyday assistance tactical dot llc um if you click the little my link thing here in the description you'll be able to find that blake thank you for coming on It was an absolute pleasure, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. That's all I've got for episode 17, Reconnaissance and the Tactical Civilian. As always, guys, train hard, train often. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder. Call me what you wanna, but you can't call me no coward. Strength in numbers, we the people, still the ones with power. Fighting fire with fire, time to take back what is ours. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder.